My name is Dermot Smith. I am the HSC National Clinical Lead for Diabetes. This DVD is an educational DVD for all healthcare professionals involved in the care of the diabetic foot. The National Diabetes Program has devised a national model of care for the management of the foot. This has come in a background of the employment of 16 new podiatrists, which will be based in specialists, foot protection teams, or foot protection services across the country. The National Diabetes Programme has devised a model of care where patients will be examined and depending on their examination they will be classified as either low risk, moderate risk, high risk or active foot disease patients. Low risk patients do not need to be seen by the hospital based podiatrist. Moderate risk patients are those patients who have either absent sensation or absent foot pulses. These patients should be seen at least once a year by a podiatrist based in the community or in the hospital. High risk patients are those patients who have both absent sensation and absent foot pulses or peripheral arterial disease. Patients who have a history of a healed foot ulcer also belong to this category. These patients should be seen at least once a year by the podiatrist based in the hospital specialist foot protection team or foot service. Patients with active foot disease are those patients with an active foot ulcer or an acute charcoal foot. These patients need to be seen immediately and should be seen within 24 to 48 hours of referral by the podiatrist based in the specialist hospital foot protection team or foot service. I would like to thank everyone who is involved in the making of this DVD. I hope you find it informative and educational. Diabetes mellitus is a chronic medical condition that consumes about 10% of the total healthcare budget. The majority of this cost is incurred in treating diabetes related complications. There is unequivocal evidence that early detection and adequate management of diabetes can reduce morbidity, mortality and cost of care. Foot care problems are a well recognised cause of morbidity and disability in patients with diabetes. Early recognition and management of risk factors such as neuropathy and peripheral vascular disease can prevent or delay such outcomes as limb amputations and ulcerations. An estimated 239 million euro was spent by the HSE between 2005 and 2009 on the preventable complications of diabetes related ulcers and the resulting amputations. It is estimated that each ulcer and amputation costs between 25 and 30,000 euro in inpatient costs alone. International studies have shown that with an organised foot care programme the incidence of foot ulcers and diabetes related lower limb amputation rates can be reduced by over 40%. Integral to the delivery of this foot care programme is the primary care nurse who will carry out examination of the normal foot and identify risk factors in patients with diabetes. We hope that this DVD will be a useful information tool for primary care nurses. The foot is composed of 26 bones and 55 articulations and is responsible for transmitting the ground reaction force to the body during standing, ambulation and other activities. In static and dynamic situations such as walking, running, jumping and landing, the foot is subjected to large loads which, unless effectively transmitted, would be likely to overload not only the foot but also other parts of the skeletal system. In dynamic situations, the foot is required to act as both a shock absorber to cushion the impact of contact of the foot with the ground and as a propulsive mechanism to propel the body in the desired direction. The foot often performs these functions on a variety of support surfaces. The ability of the foot to function effectively in relation to such diverse environmental constraints is due to its structure, in particular its arched shape and complex movement ability. The arched shape of the foot is maintained by passive mechanisms called ligaments and active mechanisms called muscles. The ligaments on the plantar aspect of the foot are very strong 
and can normally maintain the arch of the foot in upright posture in the absence of assistance from the plantar muscles. The majority of foot ulcers in people with diabetes have a biomechanical etiology. Therefore, it is important to have an understanding of the causes, treatment and prevention of foot injury in patients with diabetes. While peripheral vascular disease has long been associated with lower limb problems in the diabetic patient, it is now well recognized that the majority of injuries to the foot, principally ulcers, are as a result of mechanical trauma that the patient does not recognize because of diabetes-related distal symmetrical polyneuropathy. Most skin injuries seen on the feet of patients with diabetic neuropathy occur in the forefoot. Those on the dorsum of the forefoot are generally related to ill-fitting footwear, and those on the plantar surface are frequently sites of high pressure under the foot. In the diabetic foot, plantar pressure increases in localized areas due to abnormal foot conditions. Increased plantar pressures can lead to tissue breakdown and ulceration. Correctly fitting footwear is central to injury prevention in the patients with diabetic foot complications. Accommodative footwear can cushion the plantar surface from increased pressures and can prevent dorsal injury. Footwear can therefore be critical in preventing injury in patients with newly diagnosed neuropathy and are essential in the patient who already has experienced a neuropathic ulcer. According to the 2010 National Diabetes Programme, patients at low risk of diabetic foot disease will be managed preventatively through annual screening and regular foot inspections and examinations by primary care nurses. A low-risk patient has normal pulses, normal vibration and sensation to 10 gram monofilament, no history of foot ulceration, no significant foot deformity or no visual impairment. The aim of diabetic foot screening is to allow categorization into low, moderate at risk, high at risk and patients with active foot disease. Based on this assessment, the patient will be allocated to a risk group using the diabetes foot care pathway. A medical history should be recorded, diabetes history including glycemic control and HbA1c, previous foot history and previous foot education, complications of diabetes, smoking history, visual impairment, social isolation, access to health care and medication history. The dermatological assessment should include a global inspection of the feet, including interdigitally for the presence of maceration, ulceration or abnormal erythema. The presence of callus, particularly hemorrhagic callus, nail dystrophy or paronychia should be recorded. Record any history of psoriasis or eczema, check skin status for colour, thickness, dryness and cracking, sweating, ulceration or oedema. The musculoskeletal assessment should include evaluation for any signs of gross deformity. Rigid deformities are defined as any contractures that cannot easily be manually reduced and are found most frequently in the digits. Common foot deformities that are known to increase plantar pressure and are associated with skin breakdown include claw toes, hammer toes, mallet toes. Hallux limitus, hallux rigidus, hallux valgus and pace cavus. A rocker bottom deformity secondary to Charcot osteoarthropathy can cause excessive pressure at the plantar midfoot, increasing the risk of ulceration at that site. Loss of protective pain sensation or peripheral neuropathy is a complication of diabetes that plays a major role in the development of foot ulceration. A level of sensory loss that allows patients to hurt themselves without recognizing injury is a major component of nearly all diabetic ulcerations. As many as 15% of people with diabetes will develop a foot ulcer during their lifetime. 
Figures suggest that 50% of patients attending diabetic foot clinics will have peripheral neuropathy. Foot ulceration precedes amputation in approximately 85% of non-traumatic cases. An annual neurological review will allow early identification of sensory loss and prompt intervention to prevent deterioration. The Sams Weinstein 10 gram monofilament has been proven as an efficient, easy to use, inexpensive device for diabetic peripheral neuropathy screening. The 10 gram monofilament consists of a plastic handle supporting a nylon filament and is one of the most frequently utilized screening tools to identify loss of protective sensation. The sensory exam should be carried out in a quiet and relaxed setting. The test should be explained to the patient. Apply the monofilament to the patient's hand to reduce any residual stiffness of the monofilament before testing. The patient is asked to close their eyes so as not to observe the examiner applying the monofilament. Ask the patient to say yes every time he or she feels the monofilament touch the skin. Apply the monofilament perpendicular to the patient's skin surface. Apply sufficient pressure to cause the monofilament to bend approximately one centimeter. Hold in position for one to two seconds and slowly release the pressure until the monofilament is straight. Remove from the skin. Repeat this procedure on the testing sites on both feet. Make sure to conduct the test randomly, to alter time intervals between testing sites and vary the sites tested. Do not apply the monofilament to an ulcer site, callus, scar or necrotic tissue. The test is abnormal if the patient cannot sense the monofilament and may be a predictor of risk of future foot ulceration. The tuning fork is widely used in clinical practice and provides an easy qualitative evaluation of vibratory sensation. Vibratory sensation should be tested over the tip of the hallux bilaterally. An abnormal response can be defined as when the patient loses vibratory sensation which the examiner still perceives while holding the fork on the tip of the hallux. Autonomic neuropathy results in dryness and fissuring of the skin with distended dorsal veins. Motor neuropathy presents classically with a high medial longitudinal arch and migration of the fatty pad underneath the toes, thus exposing the metatarsal heads, which can lead to tissue breakdown and ulceration. Diabetes mellitus is a significant risk factor for the development of peripheral arterial disease. Peripheral arterial occlusive disease is four times more prevalent in patients with diabetes. The arterial occlusion typically involves the tibial and perineal arteries, but spares the dorsalis pedis. Smoking, hypertension and dyslipidemia commonly contribute to the increased prevalence of peripheral arterial occlusive disease in patients with diabetes. Peripheral arterial disease is a component cause in approximately one third of foot ulcers and is a significant risk factor associated with recurrent wounds. Therefore, vascular assessment is important in defining overall lower extremity risk status. There is a general consensus that diabetic patients should receive regular vascular assessment to allow early identification of vascular changes and prompt intervention to prevent deterioration. The presence of lower extremity ischemia is determined by a combination of clinical signs and symptoms, as well as abnormal non-invasive vascular tests. Signs and symptoms may include claudication, pain occurring in the arch or forefoot at rest or during the night, absent popliteal or posterior tibial pulses, thinned or shiny skin, absence of hair on the lower leg and foot, thickened nails, redness of the affected area when the legs are dependent, and pallor when the foot is elevated. Compare temperature gradient and check capillary refill times in both legs. Check temperature gradient just to see if there's any difference we move from proximal to distal and that's very good okay and it should be less than five seconds which is that's great 
The NICE guidelines state that the diabetic foot should include palpation of the pedal pulses. The dorsalis pedis pulse is located lateral to the extensor hallucis tendon on the dorsum of the foot. The posterior tibial pulse is located above and behind the medial malleolus. In the neuropathic foot, bounding foot pulses may be as a result of autonomic neuropathy, which can cause dilation of the arteries, whereas blood flow to the toes may be compromised. Therefore, palpation of the pedal pulses should not be taken in isolation, but in combination with other assessments such as Doppler ultrasound, ankle brachial pressure indices, and measurement of toe pressures. Doppler ultrasound is the most widely used method for diagnosing vascular disease in the diabetic foot. It is particularly effective in locating absent pulses and quantifying vascular disease progression. The ankle brachial pressure index assesses the severity of vascular disease in the lower limb. An ankle brachial pressure index below 0.9 is a sign of peripheral arterial disease. However, medial arterial calcification, which is common in patients with diabetes, will cause the vessels to lose elasticity and become rigid and can show falsely elevated ratios. Measurements of toe pressures or transcutaneous pressure of oxygen should also be recorded. Feet and shoes should be inspected daily. Wash feet daily and dry carefully, especially between the toes. Water temperature should always be below 37 degrees Celsius. Moisturising creams should be applied daily, but not between the toes. Socks should be changed daily. Wear stockings with seams inside out or preferably without seams. Do not walk barefoot either indoors or outdoors. Do not wear shoes without socks. Nails should be cut straight across. Do not use chemical agents or plasters to remove corns or calluses. Corns and calluses should be treated by a podiatrist. Do not use a heater or hot water bottle to warm feet. A healthcare provider should be notified immediately if a blister, cut, sore or injury occurs. Emphasize the need for another person with appropriate skills to inspect feet should the individual with diabetes be unable to do so. The patient should be made aware of the need to ensure that feet are examined regularly by a healthcare provider. In conclusion, strategies to reduce problems in patients with diabetic foot complications should include risk stratification, foot care education, accommodative footwear, regular podiatry treatment and monitoring of further complications, prompt referral for specialist care and emergency services providing rapid access to help patients in trouble. Thank you for your attention and we hope that this DVD will be of benefit to you and your patients.